said it to you all, no one would come up to me and correct me. Well, I'm so delighted to be here with you. I bring you greetings from my family and from my colleagues. I'm working now in Washington, D.C. with the church uh, with a ministry uh, you may have heard of called Adventist Review. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of the Adventist Review? <laughs> Did you know that the Adventist Review and Herald, as it was, before we were a church, we were a publishing agency? Did you know that? For years, we were publishing, and the word went out so fast that they said, we better organize and become a church. That's what happened. Well, I have the distinct pleasure of working with the church now. For years, I've been working independent ministries, and I'm giving you a little bit of background because several people say, we don't know who you are. We don't know anything about you. Well, um, I was in... Hollywood. I used to write and I was working in television and that was before and I don't want to give too much away because I share some of my testimony at the 11 o'clock hour or whenever your second service or first service is but um, I was working in the industry the entertainment industry and it was it was just after be I became an Adventist in 1996 under the preaching of Mark Finley with Net 96. Anybody remember Net 96? Yeah. Oh, I thought that was the most powerful thing, and I was so happy to come under that. In fact, I recently got a chance to go up to Mark Finley. It's so, God is so good. <laughs> I am so blessed to be able to walk through the halls of that building and occasionally just walk by the guy who I heard this message from for the first time. I tell you, God just puts things in order. But anyway, in 1996, I came into the Adventist church and I was so delighted and so excited. I'll tell you more about that. But I, shortly thereafter, after coming into the church, I started working in the, well, I was in the industry before that, but I went back to Los Angeles, and I was working there, and I was getting increasingly uh, uncomfortable working in Hollywood with all the truth that I knew. And it finally hit a hit. I, I, I became a vice president at Turner Broadcasting in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was there, and then the Lord completely took me out of I like to say he rescued me from the entertainment industry. And I said, here's what I said. I said, I will never work in television again. That's what I said. I said that. God laughed at me. He laughs at us. He says, you know what? I make all the plans. And then 3ABN called me and offered me to work on a show called From Sickness to Health. That is the title of the program that we're doing this weekend. We do it under that heading because we want to see people go from sickness to health. But anyway, I started working there. Uh, we did 26 episodes. It's currently airing. We did it for Dare to Dream Network, working with Yvonne, Dr. Yvonne, and um, Yvonne Lewis. And then it made its way over to 3ABN where it now is. I think it's on both of the channels. Not only is it there, but it's also on a little channel that we've started that's Christian videos on demand called Adventist Review Television. And I am leading out in that effort to create content that people see on social media. How many of you are on social media? Facebook and all that. Well, you know, that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful vehicle for us to reach the world because everyone's on it. Billions of people watch videos every single day on Facebook or Instagram and all these things. So anyway, that's what I'm doing there. But this weekend, this weekend we are going to be sharing with you what I like to call the great health controversy. The gr great health controversy. Anyone here believe that there is a health controversy? Anybody believe that there's a great controversy? Now, let me see your hands. I want to make sure. Now, why do you know that there's a great controversy? How do you know? Is there something that tipped you off? The Bible says that there is a great, not a small, but a great controversy. And what we don't fully realize is how health, diet, and food, but I'm being broader in saying health has always been in the very center of the controversy. Did you know that? 
Whether you start there in Genesis with Adam and Eve, you can go from Genesis and go all the way to the book of Revelation, and you will find that health, food, diet plays a role in this thing we call the great controversy, and that's why we call it the great health controversy. You go from Adam and Eve, and you, you don't have to go very far, and you see that things made from food, derived from food, like wine, was a thing that caused Noah to even stumble. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I must have looked thirsty to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Can't, go, can't get up here and talk about water and not have some. But then you, you, you go from Noah and you know what happened there with wine, you know, and then you find that even Lot, Lot, same thing, wine derived from food, which caused his fall, where he had relations with his own daughters and created the Moabite people who became the worst enemies of God's people. Again, you can continue. You don't even have to get far out of the book of Genesis, and you'll find that there was a man by the name of Esau, who actually was willing to sell his own birthright for what? Food. For food. Children of Israel, as they journey through the wilderness, you find that they had their issues with, and who knew how to use food just so that it would cause them to stumble? The enemy. We're even told that he will constantly use the same methods because appetite is powerful. Oh, it's interesting to be talking about this right at the beginning of the year when many of us are making resolutions. Is that right? Oh, he's laughing like, like you're very familiar with this. Yes, we make all these resolutions about what we're going to do now. Oh, 2018, this is going to be the year. This will be the one that I'm going to make all these changes. And how are you doing? Here's what I'm going to share with you throughout this weekend. It's not so much, hear this, it's not so much that we need a New Year's resolution as much as we need a New Year's revelation. And not just any old revelation. We need a revelation of Jesus. In fact, we are told, we are told that this world needs exactly what it needed a few thousand years ago, a revelation of Jesus, of his character of love, his great love for the human family. We need a fresh revelation. In fact, could you ever, ever reach the point where you are fully, that you have a full revelation of Christ? Is that possible? It's not even possible, is it? Oh, every time I look, and really look, I mean Bob, I mean really look. He's more beautiful all the time. As I see him in the sanctuary, as I see him in almost everything, he becomes more attractive to me. And this weekend, I have not come to get you to eat more veggie links <laughs> or eat more vegetables, although that would be nice. To eat more fruit or nuts and seeds, that would also be a wonderful byproduct. I have come this weekend, and I must tell you, was excited to come to be able to share fresh revelations of Jesus through the health message. Amen. Is that all right? So one thing you will know from this weekend, you won't have to say, well, what can we eat? You won't have to do that. Because I won't even tell you what to eat. Oh, I know that excites you. You've been to many health talks before, and someone comes in and they start to tell you all the very good science, and it's good science. All the very good science about what you should eat and what you should not eat, and sometimes you're just weary with it. With it. You've heard it enough times. Do you know that most people can hear all of that? And it's, as I mentioned, it's very good science. It's up-to-date science. It's evidence-based science. And yet people will nod heads, smile, and will agree, and will walk home, and will eat the same thing that was just shared that they shouldn't eat. You know what I'm talking about. I've been there, and you've been there. But 
as I looked at this, and I've been giving health talks since I left the industry and started a ministry called The Beehive, I noticed something. Nothing moves people like Jesus. I searched, friends. I did. I looked for everything I could in terms of health in the Bible. And there's a lot that the Bible has to say regarding health. But I could not find where it said anywhere, if veggie links be lifted up, they'll draw all people. I couldn't find it. But you know what I did find? That Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men. I will draw all people. So what do we want to do this weekend? We want to draw nigh to Jesus as we lift him up. I will not talk about this health thing without talking about Jesus. So here's the norm. The norm that I'm setting for these meetings is that you won't hear me say what you should eat. I won't play the plate police. I will share Jesus, and I will share good information about health. And as wise people created in the image of God, you will make your own intelligent decisions, won't you? And what I find, you know what I find? is that when you lift up Jesus and give good information, people go home and they perform their own refrigerectomy. They do. You know what that is? Yeah, those things, yeah. yeah. So that's what we want to do. Are you okay with that? All right, let's have a word of prayer as we begin tonight, all right? Our loving Father and our God, thank you so much, first and foremost, for granting each and every one of us traveling mercies, that we might be here to share in this time together. We thank you, Lord, for that great gift that you gave to this world. When you gave your only begotten Son, Lord, I'm thanking you, and along with all of my friends here, we are thanking you for that precious gift. We don't even fully realize and understand just the depth of what you did at Calvary. But Lord, that's not going to stop us this weekend from attempting to know and understand and to see you more clearly. Bless us, Lord, with your spirit. The Bible declares that we can do nothing without it. In fact, we're told it shall not be by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. So therefore, Lord, together we claim the promise together. First of all, we realize that no man can teach us, but the anointing will teach us. That is your Holy Spirit. So we claim the promise that if we, being evil, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more shall our Heavenly Father give the gift of the Holy Spirit to them that ask? And We are asking in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said, the whole theme of tonight, can you see the screen okay? Yep. Yeah? See the banners okay? We're going to be looking at the great health controversy, but we're going to, in this segment, to kick it all off, we're going to look at Christ, our saving health. Christ, our what? Our saving health. Now, that is how the King James translates that. It's really Christ who is our salvation. It's Psalm 67, verse 2, that you'll find there. Psalm 67 and verse 2. It says that thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving health among all nations. Now, you'll recall right away from that text that Jesus himself said in John chapter 14 and verse 6, he says, I am the way, that the world might know the way. What way? The way to what? The way to all health. The way to all saving knowledge. Now, as I mentioned to you, that word is translated salvation, that they may know thy saving health. It's really thy salvation. But I'm going to let you in on something that's so powerful to me. Perhaps you already know it. In the Bible. Where? In the Bible, God does not distinguish, he makes no distinction between health and salvation. 
He doesn't. They're the same words, even in the Greek. In the Greek, when you, you'll recall a very familiar story of the woman who came to him with the issue of blood. Do you remember? She reached out and she touched the hem of his garment. And when she touched his garment, the Bible says at that moment, she was made whole. In fact, Jesus told her, he said, thy faith has made you whole. That word is Z O Z. O, I'm sorry, S-O-Z-O, sozo, sozo, S-O-Z-O, that means whole or healthy, complete. Now, in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, it says something very similar, but it refers to salvation. It says, by no other name can we be saved, that same word is sozo, S-O-Z-O. -O. So in the Bible, God sees health and salvation as one thing, Amen. together. In other words, you cannot have salvation without wholeness. Now, please don't misunderstand me. Does that mean you can't have salvation unless you're on a certain diet? No, of course not. What God looks down and what he desires for us is wholeness, mentally, physically, spiritually, even socially. God wants us to be complete in him. In fact, that's how he designed us. That's who we are. So we want to look at this whole idea of health in a complete sort of perspective, from a complete perspective. Does that make sense so far? So God wants us to have that saving health. Where will we get it from? Here's what I was just describing to you. Sozo, salvation, and wholeness. Same word. In fact, in the, in the Hebrew, you'll find the same thing. And I'll share that with you as we go along. But God has a tough time. God has a what? He has a very tough time describing, explaining these things to us, you know, we're told, by the way, is it okay, is it okay, I'm going to ask you, is it okay to use the spirit of prophecy in this church? I want to be respectful. It's all right? It's all right. I was going to do it anyway, but it's nice to know that you all have, you are very approving and all of that, so I appreciate that. But we are told that God desires us to understand him. He wants us to know him. But it's difficult. Jesus spent most of his time saying, you know, the kingdom of heaven is it's like this, right? It's very difficult. The image that we were created in, we're told that it was well nigh obliterated. In other words, we don't function with the same brain capacity that we did once we were created. Adam in the garden was a lot smarter than us. Would you agree with that? In fact, for years, many years, they didn't even eat books. You told them something, they remembered it. Imagine that. Kids could never say, I forgot. Right? But here in Isaiah 55, it really puts it into perspective. It says, for my thoughts are not what? Your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and even my Thoughts are much higher than your thoughts. So what is God to do? He has to give us, he has to give us things in a manner in which we can understand them. So when we look at the laws of health, these appear to be things that are just about the physical or just in the physical realm. But I'm going to submit to you that God gives us physical things to help us to understand the more complex, more difficult spiritual things. Are you following that? How many of you are married here? Do you know that your wonderful marriage of many years, I'm sure, is really to help you understand the relationship that you are to have with Christ? He's going to marry you, like it or not. The church is a woman. 
And she's a bride, and she's waiting for the bridegroom, isn't she? Our legal system is all about God's law. It's derived from his law. He gives us legal things to help us to understand this great thing about law. And what would you say is, whether it's the Ten Commandments, whether it's any law, what is the absolute goal or objective of a law? Obedience. Would you say it's obedience? Anybody else? By the way, this is Friday night. And this is a great time for you to just have some dialogue with me. In fact, I'm going to ask you to use your Bibles a little bit, if that's okay, because I know that you've had a tough week, and it helps you to stay awake when you're actually engaged, even with looking at your Bibles. Amen? Oh, you're, you're, you're coming from the same perspective, obedience, and there's a penalty. What else? Justice. Oh, boy. You're a theologian. Yes. You first. His law is to know him. Ah, we're getting, we're, we're softening. Is that where you want to go as well? Same thing? Happiness. There's joy. Well, th okay, think about it now. Let's, let's really put this into perspective because if, if we can understand the law from God's vantage point, if we can understand it from his perspective, then we can begin to move into that experience where we see that God is not a God that's being restrictive even on the level of diet because he gave us health laws. Yes? But if we understand the very essence of what God desires in a law, all we have to do is look at, really, the laws that we abide by. Why do you have stop signs? Ah, I like that word. It's to protect. It's to protect you. Are there other things in your neighborhood that are there to protect you? Absolutely. There are lots of laws. Most laws are there to protect you from a thief, from a robber, from someone injuring you. They're there for protection. And we understand that God's law is a law of love. It is a transcript of his character. So therefore, whatever God gives us by, the way, of, by way of law, he has done it so that he can protect his beloved. Does that make sense to you? So even these health laws, these principles, and I'm going to go through them, and we're going to look at them as we go through, and I want you to think differently. It's not about God's going to punish your body if you don't get to bed at night. Maybe there's something deeper there. Maybe there's something we missed. Is it possible? Oh, boy. Is it possible that we could not only begin to understand the love in God's law, but also see his righteousness. Is it possible that we can see the very goodness, the very essence of God and what he desires for his children by even looking at his health laws? Well, something that is very important to me, I love the study of the Bible. Anybody with me? I love seeing... God's righteousness, his justification, or the justification by faith in the righteousness of Christ. Oh, I was in my study this week, and I read a statement that said, without his righteousness, our services, our church services are no good to him at all. Unless we enter into an experience with him where we recognize that we've come to receive the blessed righteousness of another. We come with nothing, right? The physical always points to the spiritual. It's a favorite statement of mine found in Review and Herald. April the 2nd, 1889, it says, As it is in the physical economy, so it is in the spiritual economy. I'm not sure why I'm not getting any response from my clicker here. Uh, it might be some of the other uh, instruments, but maybe help me out with the click. 
But if you just give it one click, I think I can get what I wanted there. Yes, the physical points always to the spiritual. And we see that God, for 4,000 years, he took a physical lamb just to teach them about the lamb of God who would one day come and die for his people. Yes? I'm excited to share with you tomorrow afternoon. When? Tomorrow afternoon, how there's something that we may have missed. We have not seen food. God is also trying to teach us something through food about himself. But that's tomorrow. I'd like to give cliffhangers. I'll get you back here. Give me another click. Yeah, I think it's the distance. There you go. As it is in the physical economy, so it is in the spiritual. April 2nd, 1889. So whatever you see in the physical, you probably can find a spiritual object lesson that will bless you. So that's what we're going to go on. A, we're going to go on this journey of seeking to find that which is physical and then seeing the spiritual meaning. Now, some of you have already taken notice and said, wow, he got a little overzealous. There are eight laws of health, but I see there he's got ten. Well, it's the basic same eight laws of health, and I know that many of you have seen it, and certainly you find from the Spirit of Prophecy in Ministry of Healing, page 127, where she says these are the natural remedies, and she lists them, the eight laws. But I, 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 I said, well, when I read Genesis, and I found all eight in Genesis, I saw something else there. And I said, wait a minute. It's not just water and sunshine and fresh air. and There's something else. The trust is there. And there's something beautiful about Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. I discovered that if you just had those three chapters alone, do you know that you really don't need any other part of the Bible? Is that a bold statement? I think it is. It is a bold statement. But consider with me. You know who made you. Right there in Genesis, chapter 1, you know when to worship, you know who to marry, right? You know what to eat. Yeah? Sure. yeah. You, know, you know all these different things, these very important, you know even who saves you, Genesis chapter 3, and that's the most important one. You even know how this thing ends in the first three chapters of Genesis. So as I went looking, I began to see in the book of Genesis that were two other very important principles of health. This is actually a principle of health. Now, I will deal with these tomorrow in Sabbath school. I will deal with the ones you're more familiar with tonight, and we probably won't even get through all of those as we look for Jesus in the health message. But you can believe that investing time in others is a health principle. The Bible even bears that out. That's why it says in Luke, it is better to give than it is to receive. It is better to do things for others, and when you do it, there's a health benefit to you for doing it. Right? Systematic benef beneficence or benevolence. Educate yourself. Oh, I can't wait to share with you that one. That is a powerful health principle that most people don't realize, but you find it right in the first few chapters of Genesis. Now, just from a purely scientific standpoint, if you continue to educate your mind, if you read every day, right, if you study, keep your mind active, you're less likely to have a lot of the uh, neurological degenerative diseases, right? Alzheimer's, dementia, right? That's why as we start to age, it is much more important to read your Bible, to study, and to just keep your mind active. There was one gentleman down there at Loma Linda, and he was sharing how he was just about to turn 90 years old. Oh, I love these kind of stories. He was about to turn 90 years of age. He looked great. He was swimming, and he was describing what his date was going to look like. And he said, I'm swimming down here with my friends today, but this afternoon I'm going up to the mountains for a hike, and then I'm going to ski. You know, you can do that in Southern California. 90 years old, and he was going to go and ski. But one of the things that really stuck out, and I put it in our book that we put together on the longest living Americans and what their health habits are, 
He said, he says, I have found that if I keep my body moving and I keep my mind active and I keep learning, I'm always in the best shape of my life. See, the human body is designed different from the trinkets and toys and machines that we have. They wear out when you use them. The human body and the mind wears out when you don't use them. Make sense? So God says, I'm going to have to have you keep it moving. Keep it moving. Now, there are some facts on stress. Let's keep this going. 70 to, 75 to 90% of all doctor's office visits are for stress-related ailments or complaints. Have that up there, right? Help me out, technology. Come on. If you click it for me, that would be so much better. I appreciate it. I'm going to figure this out. So stress can play a part in problems such as headaches, skin conditions, asthma, right? Um, arthritis, indigestion, depression, and anxiety. Click it one more time. Stress produces cortisol. Talk a lot about that cortisol, which is a good, you know, that's your fight or flight stress hormone that's going to either get you out of a bad situation or help you be victorious over that situation. But if you're not moving, it can be lethal to you. Elevates cholesterol levels, elevates blood pressure, increases the risk of cardiovascular disease, leads to all types of abdominal obesity and other issues. So stress is a killer. Now, we need stress. How many of you are stressed out? You have stress. Now, it's not a bad thing. You need stress. Even when you actually are looking to build up muscle, muscles, you are lifting weights, that's resistance training, and that is stress on the muscles, but it will build your muscles. So you need stress. God gives us stress, but here's the thing. When we are constantly under stress, unmanaged stress, it is an indication that God hardwired us for that lets us know, He knows it, that we don't trust Him enough. I have met people who have said, you know, I'm, I've got this problem, pray for me. And I say, all right, I'll pray. And they'll tell me what the problem is. And, and then I'll say, yeah, well, let's pray about it. Let's pray right now. And they, we pray. And then after we pray, you can tell they're still stressed out. And I said, what was the purpose of the prayer? Right? See, God lets us know that we're, that we're not trusting him when we start to stress out. You get the headaches. That's, that's a signal. You don't trust me. One woman was so stressed out. Her hair was falling out. I said, you're not trusting God? She said, yes, I am. I said, then why is your hair falling out? Right? So we need to trust God more. And you've heard that before. But now let's turn and go a little deeper. Do you have a text, by the way? Is there a, test, a text that you have that whenever you're a little stressed out that you turn to? Ah, I will keep him, that's Isaiah, isn't it? I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed, not on your situation, but on me. Anybody else have a text that you turn to when you need to trust God? Cast all his cares, that's Peter. Cast all your cares on him. He cares for you. It reduces your stress when you know that God cares for you. And my sister here, you're nodding because you were about to go to Proverbs, weren't you? Now listen to that. She has committed it to memory. That means that this is near and dear. That's like a sword. You are armed and dangerous, aren't you? She can pull that, when, pull that out whenever she needs it. She can pull that out. But here's my question. What if we went on just a little deeper? Have you, ever, have you committed to memory the next couple of verses? Ah, have you? What does it say next? And lean not thine own understanding, but in all thy ways do what? Acknowledge him, and he shall, not he might, he shall do what? Direct thy path. Now, please turn there with me. I want you to see the health message come alive for you in the next verse. What are we looking at? Proverbs chapter 3, 5, 6. I think we just did 7. Now, look at verse 8. Mm. It shall be what? 
it shall bring health to your navel. How about that? How many of you would like to have a healthy navel? <laughs> what did you just say? That's where it all began. See, when God mentions a body part or an animal, don't skip over it. Linger there with Jesus and allow him to tell you what he's trying to say. If he says, it shall be health to your navel, he's referencing something deeply spiritual. But he's using something physical to help you understand that which is spiritual. Now, what took place there with that navel? What is that the vestiges of? What is that the remnant of? It was a connection that you had to the mother. Go deeper. Any of you had this experience where you were connected to a mother at some point? Anybody? <laughs> that would be good. But all of us came through this same process of growing in a mother's womb. And can any of us, you don't remember much from that day, but, or those days, but you never had to say mom, or you never had to fear that your mom was not going to feed you. Because when she ate, you ate. So this symbiotic relationship that God designed, he's letting you know that that's what it's like with me. When you trust me, when you're a part of me, when you're connected to me, all that is mine is yours. Is that what Jesus says? Are you not joint heirs with Jesus? Everything that he has accomplished, does he say, I will allow you to sit with me in my throne as I have overcome, you can overcome? Oh, don't you want to trust that? That's what I want to trust. That's what I trust. That this God who did everything, whenever I'm tempted to doubt, do you know where I look? Calvary. Calvary. Right to that cross. And I have no excuse. Listen. Listen to me, friends. I am talking me personally. I have no excuse to ever not trust God when I look at Calvary. But next, what's the next line? It'll be help to your navel. And what else? It will be strength. One version says strength to your bones. Mine says and marrow to your bones. See, there's something about marrow in the translation that is strong, that is strength. What is it? What happens in the bone marrow? That's where life is produced. Why? Because what kind of cells are there? Don't you love the Bible? I tell you, the Bible is the greatest medical book ever written. It's the, you laugh. It is the greatest medical book ever written. Why? You can have some type of physician's just reference book that will explain some pathology. However, it'll only help you to live a few years longer. Right? 70 and maybe 10 more. If you live like an Adventist, another 10. Maybe 20. But this book has the formula for eternal life. Eternal life. How many of you are looking for that? I am. So, in the bone marrow, what is produced there? You said it. That's where the cells are produced. Red blood cells, white blood cells, even your stem cells are produced in the bone marrow. Now, should we stop right there? No. We must ask our que ourselves the question. Why is God referencing the bone marrow? And the place where red blood cells and white blood cells and stem cells are produced. Why? Because Leviticus tells us that the life of the flesh is in the blood. Huh? The life of the flesh is in the blood. And the red blood cells is that life that flows. It comes from the bone marrow. And what God wants you to know, when you trust me, when you trust me, it is life to you. And if anything, now watch this. How beautiful is this? Even the white blood cells are there. So if anything threatens that life, 
The Bible tells you. Just as the white blood cells are your immune system, they fight for you. The Bible tells us in Isaiah, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise a standard against them. That's your immune system. So God wants you to know, you can trust me. It's life to you. And I have designed the body that I'll even protect that life. You want to know how God protects you? Just look to your bones. We're told in the book Education. Which book? Education. It tells us that of all the education we could get, the greatest education we could have is simply on our anatomy and our physiology because therein you will find the gospel. Everything that God has done in your body is designed to protect you out of his great love for you. I was reading today that around the country, flu is going around. Did you catch it? Yes. Oh, I'm so glad that you got over it and that you're here tonight. But 30 children have died in this country just in the last couple of weeks from the flu. Many of them, well, I won't touch that, but have died. The beauty of this whole experience, if you should happen to get the flu, right? You did. You caught it. Caught it what? Coughing? Coughing. Sneezing? Exactly. Yeah, you've got the fever? Yeah. Do you know all those things were not, they, there. they were not all designed, the, the, those things were not designed to make you miserable, although they may have. It made you a little miserable, I understand. But the design of your body is you're designed to sneeze out whatever came in that would harm you to cough out whatever is lingering in your chest. And the fever was to fight whatever was going to try to actually really, really take you out. That's a design. It was the psalmist who said in Psalm 139, 14, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You and I, all of us, are fearfully and wonderfully made. It is a design based on a law of love. Amen? In fact, did you know this? There's something called the circuseptin rhythm. Anybody hear that? Circuseptin. You know about the circadian rhythm, right? That is the sleep-wake cycle based on sun up, sun down, right? Sun up, serotonin. As the sun begins to set, it synthesizes and your body starts to secrete melatonin, which allows you to have a good night's rest, right? That's a daily thing. It happens every day. That's a law. But there's something called the circuseptin rhythm, and that's based on a seven-day cycle. Did you know this? And it is perfectly demonstrated in the human body because every seven days, your immune system spikes. Therefore, a cold should never last more than a week. And this is even more perfectly demonstrated when a person has received an organ transplant, liver, kidney. They have to give them anti-rejection drugs on the seventh day because the body will reject it. And then they have to come back and do it again on the 14th day in this seven-day cycle. So just as we have on this earth a weekly seven-day cycle, Within the human body is the same law. Can you trust this God? How beautiful is he? He thought of it. Is there anything that he hasn't thought of? Not one thing. Not one. Can I give you one more and trust and then we'll move to the next one? Okay. You already know this. I love this idea. The Bible teaches. It's so beautiful. It so shows and demonstrates Jesus and his love. What are the first four words in the Bible? The very in, in the beginning, God. You got that right too. You've been reading your Bible. In the beginning, who? Which one? How do you know? You read the Bible. In the beginning, the very first first four words of the Bible. The Bible is trying to teach you now. I wasn't an Adventist or even a Christian all my life, so therefore I came in and I had a different impression of God. 
I saw him as very rigid and strict, right? Because when I came in, you know, to the Adventist church, God bless us. I didn't know anything, but I got to tell you, people just told me what to do and what not to do. Heard very little about Jesus. Yeah, I'm telling you. I'm just telling you my experience. You may have had a different one. But I was, it was made very clear to me, this is how you keep the Sabbath. This is how you don't keep the Sabbath. This is what you watch. This is what you don't watch. This is where you go. This is where you don't go. Right? It was, it was, and I was like, okay. And I couldn't keep up. I couldn't. So even when I read certain things in the Bible, I just thought, okay, in the beginning, God. He was there. Because you go to John chapter 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. He was there in the beginning. I thought the Bible was saying, look, buddy, I was there. You weren't. You need to listen to me. Now, that sounds more like my dad, right? My earthly dad. But is that what God is saying? Was he trying to say, look, I know better than you. Just shut up and listen. I don't think so either, but that's the impression that I have. And we are being even told that in the last days of this earth, that the earth is going to be very dark, and that darkness, according to Christ's Object Lessons, page 415, it is because there is a misapprehension of the character of God. In other words, most people fear Him, even in our beloved church. We fear Him. We don't see the God of love. And listen to me, friends. He cannot come. He will not come until this world sees that he is a God of love because that's how he describes himself. So when the Bible says, in the beginning, God, it's not Muhammad or Allah or Buddha. It's no one other than what he describes of himself. He says, God is love. A little experiment with me. Would you do this? Let's take the word that he uses to define God and replace or substitute it where it is in the beginning so that it reads, in the beginning, say, oh, say it like you mean it. Love. In the beginning, love. love. That's how he describes himself. Can you trust his love? You better believe you can because the Bible says, God so loved that he gave. There's no greater trust than that. Now, isn't it beautiful? God spoke all these things. But when we bring it down to that, we see that love spoke those things. So now the Bible even reads differently. Love said, and love created, and love made. Love said, sun, get in the sky so I can keep my people warm and bring life to the planet. Love said, let the earth appear so there can be food that will grow that they may reap a harvest. Love said, this is your diet. How do you think about, how do you feel about that? I was in Southern California, I was sharing this concept, and a woman who says she had struggled for years and years and years and years with her diet, and when she heard that love said, this is my diet, she said it made all the difference in the world to her. Why? Because no longer was God exacting and saying, this is what you're supposed to eat. You're supposed to eat nuts and seeds. No, he said it because love spoke it. And there's a beautiful principle in the Bible that says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth does what? So when God spoke any word in the beginning, he spoke it from where? From the abundance of his heart of love. Does that mean something to you? Amen. 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 Now, what about rest? You got a text for that? Got a Bible text that when you're just tired, come on, you must have a Bible text. Amen. Oh, I love it when, I love it when God's people know their word. Amen. Anybody else have a text that you, that reminds you of rest, that you, it, it, it calls your mind to this whole idea of rest. 
Oh, I knew you were going to go there. I knew you would go there. Yes, the Bible does talk about a Sabbath day rest. Have refreshing rest. Going to bed earlier is linked with better mental health. Amen. We don't have to be crazy or insane. We can have good mental health by getting rest. Sleep deprivation, both short-term and long-term, leads to higher blood pressure, increase in cholesterol, increased risk of cancer or diabetes. It just, uh, decreases your immune function. Sleep duration is linked to heart health, increased BMI. So it affects metabolism. So it depends. Are you getting enough or you're not getting very much? What is your experience? Right? How about what Jesus said? Though? I'll, always, I'll always start you off with the physical and then bring you down the path where we see Jesus. Can we go looking for Jesus and rest? Yes, absolutely we can. So you gave a different few, a few texts. What about Matthew chapter 11? Come unto me, all ye who labor. Are you laboring for something? What are you laboring for? Come all who are laboring and heavy laden, and I will give you what, Bob? Rest. I will give you rest. Do you know that the Bible establishes the principle of rest right in the very beginning? The Bible says, the evening and the morning were the first day. Do you know within our culture, our biblical, our Bible culture, we understand the correct understanding of when a morning begins like no one else. It's morning right now. This is a new day. As soon as the sun set, we entered into a new day. Is that right? So God's day begins with rest. Are you following what I'm saying? Why do you think he, this was important for God to lay out? The evening and the morning were the first day, so therefore, as soon as the sun sets, rest. And you can't deny it. You cannot. We just talked about the circadian rhythm because as soon as the sun sets, you know what? That sun goes down. You start yawning. You can't even help it. Your body starts to, on a hormonal level, your body starts preparing for you to rest in sleep. Yet God who never slumbers or sleeps, is always working, always protecting, always looking over us. But you, you go and rest. See, this is trying to teach us something very deep. Something deep. If you turn with me in the book of Hebrews, there was a problem with the children of Israel, wasn't it? There was a problem with the children of Israel in Hebrews chapter 3 and into, ver into chapter 4. We find that they didn't want to rest. Did they? Well, the Bible says it. Paul, I believe the writer of Hebrews, he says, turn to Hebrews chapter 3, if you're turning with me in your Bibles. We're live streaming, I believe. So if you happen to be picking this up from somewhere, you want to turn in your Bibles and see this because a lot of times we see this in a way that the Bible's not teaching it. If we fully understand this, I believe, friends, I believe that this is the key. This is the key. Yes, we must get enough sleep. And I'll have a lot to say about sleep this weekend. But I'm going to pick up right here at the end of chapter 3 where it says, today, in verse 15, today, if you will hear <clears throat> excuse me, his voice, harden not your what? Harden not your heart, because there was a problem with some people, as Paul references them, as, it, as in the provocation. In other words, they provoked God. You know the story. It says, for some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not at that king. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm reading, and this print looks very dark, and I'm not getting enough light here. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. Then it says, but with, 
whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his, his rest? But to them that believed not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Then in chapter 4 and verse 1 it says, Let us therefore, who's us? That's us right here. It says, let us, therefore, ah, uh, and then let there be light. And then there was light. Amen. Oh, that looks so different. Can you still see the screen? Probably not as good, but we'll work with it. Let us, therefore, fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. What rest is Paul speaking of? Can, couldn't hear you. The Sabbath rest? She said the Sabbath rest. Now, I'm, I'm thankful for that answer because it represents a great multitude of us who believe that they didn't enter into the Sabbath. In other words, they didn't keep the Sabbath. But we know that they actually did. They couldn't help it. Manna fell every single day for them. But on Friday, what happened? They got a double portion of it. And then on Sabbath, what happened? It didn't fall. So there were miracles that took place that reminded them for 40 years. Right? So it wasn't that they weren't keeping the rest of the Sabbath. They weren't keeping a different rest. Yes, my sister. They were trusting in what? The, mm, do you all agree with that? She said they were trusting God. Oh, the believers. There were some. God always has a few that believe. Amen. That's very true. But the vast majority of them did not trust God, and they did not enter into his rest. In other words, they did not enter into the righteousness of Christ to care for them, to fight for them, to battle for them. Even though he said, I am the Lord thy God, I will fight for you. They did not trust that. Neither did those during the time of Jesus. A, a labor to do. What, what, what are we laboring for? What is it typically the thing that we're laboring for? Our own salvation. Do we trust that God can save us? Do you trust that God can provide for you? Have you entered into that rest? This is the rest that Jesus says. My, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. He invites us to take his yoke. And he takes ours. What a transaction. In other words, he takes our righteousness. How much do we have? The Bible says that even the good things we do are filthy rags. Jesus says, give me those. I'll give you my perfect righteousness. Rest in that. Amen? Oh, friends, that's what I want. I want that righteousness. And he calls us to enter that rest. You know, the Jews of that day, when Jesus was here, they, didn't enter it, they did not enter into it either. It gets more specific and says that instead of accepting his righteousness, they tried to produce righteousness of their own. So they didn't enter into that rest either. Even though Paul was warning them, you're about to make the mistake that they made. God forbid that we make that same mistake. God forbid Some believe, though, that it was the Sabbath. You know, they crucified Jesus, and they rushed home to keep the Sabbath. So they were keeping the Sabbath, weren't they? That's a whole different type of rest, isn't it? So what about this idea of sunshine? I'm going to give you two more because I can't talk about rest and then keep you out all night. <laughs> right? But we should enjoy sunshine. We shouldn't be fearful of it. Right? There are beautiful things that we get. Now, I know that it's a little, a little more difficult up here in the Pacific Northwest. You're challenged, sunwise. 
but you look so happy. So praise the Lord for that. There's that song, there's sunshine in my soul today. Amen. Lack of sun exposure is associated with cardiovascular disease, obesity, and diabetes. All the research shows that if you don't get enough sunshine, vitamin D, because you can't necessarily, you can get it from milk, but that's not the best source. You can get it from fish. That's not the best source. The best source, according to all the research, is from where? Is from sunshine. And it is not that vitamin D is in the sun. It's when it, God has designed a perfect sort of experience that when the sun hits your skin, hands, face, back, it then converts the cholesterol that's in your liver and it converts it to vitamin D, which functions more as a hormone than it does as a vitamin. And we find that that hormone is so necessary to fight cancer and to have good heart health. So if you're not getting enough sun, then you have to supplement. And a good number, how many of you know what your, your vitamin D levels are? <gasps> you're up here in the Pacific North, Northwest where you don't get enough sun and you know what your vitamin D numbers are? You ought to on your next, on your next appointment find out what your vitamin D levels are. You can find it from the blood test when you go. A good number is 60 to 80. That's where you want to be. Most people probably here, the research shows, living up here in the Pacific Northwest, you're below 25. That is dangerous. You need to find out what your vitamin D levels are for good cardiovascular health and to make sure that you're fighting cancer. This weekend, we want to know how to fight. We're living in a time when many of us, I saw a year in 2017 where many people who were doing everything right. So we live in a world that even if you're doing everything right, you're subject to this great health controversy. Some of you may know a man by the name of Danny Vieira. Anybody know Danny Vieira? Don't know the name? He was a health crusader, had a place down in, in Northern California for people who could go for cancer and things like that. And many people were victorious just through different types of natural treatments, and they overcame cancer, and he himself I believe he was just 60 years old, no more than 61 or two, succumbed to cancer that came on him very quickly, and they funeralized him last weekend. So we must do all that we can, not increasing our risk factors, but decreasing them. You had a comment or a question, my dear sister? Hmm. So most of you are on supplementation right now? Yeah? Well, it's, it's probably true. But, you know, there's... Um, I, I, I like to tell people, check and know. Because, why? You can overdose. You can get um, vitamin D toxicity. I heard some word that sunshine's not really good. Minimally. Okay. You will get some, but it's minimal. Okay. So then everyone here is taking supplementation then? Yes. 2,000, yeah. Good, 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 good. I mean, it's, it's where you live. It's, it's your reality. So it's good to know that. But let's learn a few more things about the sun. Because in all instances, we want to end up knowing about who? Jesus. We want to hear more about Jesus. But it is wonderful that enough a good sunshine and vitamin D lowers the blood pressure, lowers blood glucose levels, and also cholesterol via the, the vitamin D production. Now, here's what's exciting about sunshine. You got a text? Maybe this is a good text that you like. Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Then shall the Son of righteous, Righteousness rise with healing in his wings. Have you ever considered, Jesus is considered the Son of Righteousness, yes? Have you ever considered something? That Jesus 
when he created Adam, he placed him in a certain part of the garden. Anybody remember where he put him? What part of the garden did Jesus place Adam? The Bible's very specific. Not the midst. Why don't we take a look at it and get the answer, because the Bible will tell us, won't it? Turn with me to Genesis. Ah, Bob, I think you're starting to pick up on it. Genesis chapter 2. And let's look at verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man. Have you ever stopped and paused and said, wait a minute, Lord, why did you put Adam in the eastern part of the garden? Why not the western part of the garden? Was there a western part? What? The sun rises first in the east. So that must have been important to God that Adam would see first thing in the morning the rising of the sun as it's coming over the horizon. But not only that, the Bible tells us that when Jesus comes, he's coming from which area? The east. So God takes a huge ball of fire, puts it in the sky. When it rises and when we see it, it comes from the east because it is symbolizing, representing how he's going to come. But it's more than that. When Adam was placed in the garden in the eastern part, we find now Neil Netley, who was one of our seminal doctors who's done amazing research, he's a wonderful lecturer, He's got some type of therapy. It's called blue light therapy. Are you familiar with it? it? Sort of resets your hormones and you just use blue light. with using natural ultraviolet rays. Ultraviolet rays. Because when the sun is coming up over the horizon, you get the largest concentration of ultraviolet light. And we find that it's really, really good for you. Now, here's the science. The Bible says that Adam was placed in the eastern part of the garden. Well, imagine Adam there early morning. The sun is coming over the horizon, and it's coming up, and he's getting those ultraviolet rays. And we find that there's a part of the brain, part of the what? The brain is at the base of the brain. It's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. I'm not trying to use big words on you. That's just the name of it. It's the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And the suprachiasmatic nucleus is this little part of the brain that actually is the master clock of all of your cellular clocks. And when sunlight travels through the eye, down the optic nerve, it turns on the master clock of the human body that then turns on every other cellular clock. Somebody ought to say, God is awesome. Because, see, when you actually, I'm going to say something, and you all don't get on my case either. I know I'm in Seattle. But I tell you what, if you actually allowed this experience, if you could, I know it's difficult here, but when you do, you don't even need coffee in the morning. It wakes you up. Everything is energized. And they have found that when you just get out and allow the sun, now I have to tell you, this is probably the, one of the rainier weekends that I've seen. I looked at the forecast. I've been here probably in the last, oh, three years, probably 20 times. And I must say at least 90% of those times, everyone kept saying, and I was coming from Phoenix at the time, they said, boy, you brought the sun with you. Because they were the clearest, sunniest days here in the Pacific Northwest. I can't take credit, obviously, but it was so beautiful to be here when it's a clear day and you can see Mount Rainier and all the, oh, it was gorgeous. But when you have those days, it's a beautiful thing. Now, I want you to look at a text with me real quick. Then I'm going to close on water and, and, um, and exercise. But just to close up on sunlight, it says in Ecclesiastes 11:7. And Ecclesiastes 7.11. You never have to forget it. It's 11.7 or 7.11. And they say the exact same thing. I'll quote it for you, but you can look it up. In Ecclesiastes, and I might get a little Bible dyslexia here and maybe see the wrong, say the wrong one. But I believe it's in 11.7. It says, truly the light is sweet and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. 
The Bible says it's good for you to get out and let the sun come in your eyes. And then Ecclesiastes 7.11 says something very, very sim similar. It says wisdom is with the inheritance. And it is a profit for them who see the sun. I told you from the beginning of this that we needed a deeper, more beautiful revelation of what? Or who? The sun. Did you catch that? Are you with me? See, God gives us this experience that has health benefits when we see the S-U-N to let us know that there's an even greater benefit when we see the S-O-N. Especially in the morning. Now, think about Jesus for just a moment. When would he commune with his father? Sometimes he'd be out all day healing and blessing. And yet, it says, and a long time before sunrise, he would go and pray to his father. So he was there when the sun would come up and have that experience early in the morning. They say that even when the sun hits the eyes and travels the optic nerve down to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, it actually awakens you with a spiritual readiness Amen. to receive the deep things of God. Amen. Amen. Okay, just a couple more here. So we see sunshine. I'm going to skip over nutrition because I've got so much to say there that I could not cover it tonight as we begin to look at the seed. When we look at the seed. Skip over this. No, no, no. I want to take you to, that's all just sort of covering. How about exercise? Stop here. Exercise. You got a text for exercise? This one is always difficult for people. Exercise. Does the Bible say anything about exercise? No, the Bible doesn't say anything about that. We don't have to exercise. Does the Bible say anything about exercise? <laughs> I admire your confidence. <laughs> Anybody have a text? You know, exercise of all the health, all of the health uh, laws that are presented to us is the one we least like. Ah, running the race, where it gives you that imagery of the Greek uh, triathlons and athletes who would run the race, and they would run for a prize that was perishable but we run for one that is what imperishable eternal that's a good one that's a good one ah the bible does say of jesus that he walked he said i walk today tomorrow and the next day so jesus went everywhere and he walked i tell you jesus was healthy jesus was a fit man amen otherwise he couldn't have been our savior he was a lamb slain that had no spot, no blemish, no disease, nothing like that. He walked everywhere. Was he not giving us a demonstration? Yeah? How many of you enjoy walking? By the way, what is the best exercise that you can do? Swim, walking. You want me to tell you which one it is? You want to know which one it is? It's the one you do and you stick with. If you walk... Keep walking. That's the one that's the best one for you. But it has been shown that walking is one of the best exercises because you draw all and pull all the muscles into action, right? And it is difficult sometimes to get good circulation because we're told wonderful statement that says, in order to have good health, we must have good blood. And that blood must circulate perfectly. We must have perfect circulation. And without walking, where we actually from that calf muscle, push that blood up because if the blood is not being helped to get up to the heart, it becomes stagnant. So we have to walk and actually pump the blood or assist the blood to get up to the heart. Does, is there another text that you can think of? What was that? First Timothy? Okay, what you got? Let's hear it. Ah, so you went and you looked up the word exercise, did you? <laughs> Very good. Here's the one I want to close with tonight. God exercises. Did you know that? 
Now, the thing that we, as we perceive exercise, we perceive it as doing something physical, right? You're jogging. You mentioned swimming. Walking is good exercise. Lifting weights, good exercise. What's your favorite? You exercise your brain. <laughs> A true scholar indeed. But we look at it as something physical. But really, exercise, anybody military? Know someone military? Were you military? When you do things that are sort of a routine, you call it a, an exercise, right? Military exercises, right? Not necessarily the, the run that you probably hated at 5 in the morning. You didn't mind it? Yeah. Oh, man, a man after my part, own heart. That's part of being a soldier. That was part of being a soldier. <laughs> but they have military exercises, right? It's something that they do, so it gives a different definition. It's not necessarily something physical, but it's something that they do on a routine basis. Do you know that in the sanctuary, that was an exercise? It was a daily one, wasn't it? Daily, the priest or the sinner had to bring a lamb as a matter of routine, as an exercise. And that lamb was to be slain for our sins, morning and evening. It was a daily exercise. So when we talk about exercise, it's something you really do daily. Now we give, we get ourselves a pass from our doctors and from those who say, do the best you can, try to do at least five times, four to three to five times or something like that a week. You know what? God bless you if you're doing it that much. Keep it up. But I'm thankful that God exercises daily. Let's close with Jeremiah 9, 23, where it says something so special to me. Maybe it will be special to you as well. Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. And I want you to see what the Bible says. I'm going to read it in your hearing as we close tonight. The Bible says, are you there? The Bible says, thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Neither let, neither let the... What's the next one? The mighty man, glory in his might or strength. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But notice what God wants us to glory in. He says, but let him that glory, glory in this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord which exercise. God exercises. I am the God who exercises. And what does he exercise routinely? Loving kindness. He exercises judgment, good judgment. He exercises righteousness in the earth. Aren't you happy that God exercises every day? In fact, so much so, the Bible tells us in Lamentations that his mercies are what every day? They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. God is a faithful exerciser. And you know what? Even when it says his judgment in the earth. Do you know, friends, tonight, sometimes we talk about judgment and we get all scared. Don't we? I'm telling you, there's a fear, a fear of God in our churches. But God wants you to know that what he exercises, it is not the kind of judgment that we understand. When the world ends, judgment is a marriage. It's a wedding. It's a wedding. Isn't that what we find in Matthew 22? There's a wedding. Everybody can come. You want to come? You can come. Anybody can come. Just come with your wedding garment. Do you have a garment? Did you produce it? Did you sew it? No. He exercised that kind of loving kindness and righteousness, and he gave you his spot, spotless garment. I'm so happy that God exercises.
You couldn't even get to the judgment seat in the most holy place without going past the altar of burnt offerings. You couldn't get there without going past the laver where you would be washed clean, cleansed of, clean of your unrighteousness. You could not get there without being there at the table of showbread. That was God's word, which Jesus said, you've been cleansed by the word. You could not get there without passing by that candlelight, which was the Holy Spirit, which effectuated and made powerful the very word of God in your life. You could not even get there without First, going by the altar of incense, which was representative of his own righteousness to mingle with your prayers. You couldn't get there without going through that veil, which was hanging there by four different rings, which symbolized the four nails in his flesh. And then the fifth one, where it was torn asunder when he was pierced in his side. You could not get to that judgment place until you had gone sufficiently through Jesus, who was exercising daily to make sure that you're saved. Even the law that judges you is under a mercy seat. Don't you love Jesus tonight? Yeah. I'm thankful that he exercises. May he exercise that loving kindness, that judgment, and that righteousness. As we go home tonight, let us pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, we just love learning about you. Oftentimes, Lord, we, we hear health information with no Jesus. But we've determined this weekend, Lord, to lift him up to know him and hear about this wonderful gift that has been given to the world. Now, Lord, as we depart tonight, never let us be departed from your spirit. Be with us. Bring us back. Give us a wonderful Sabbath night's rest, not just sleep, but just the trust and comfort in knowing you is our prayer tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you. And good night. Hold that question. Oh, sorry, Bob. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for coming, everyone. Do you appreciate what you heard tonight? Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Rico. Uh, so tomorrow he will be here. We have 930 service. And are you doing the uh, same message for both services, correct? Or is it two different ones? Did you Okay, same one, just making sure. Um, so we have church service at 930 and 1130 uh, that Pastor or, uh, Rico Hill will be at. And then uh, he'll be also doing Sabbath school here in the sanctuary. Then the afternoon session. And then uh, Sunday from 2 to 4. So hope to see you tomorrow morning. God bless you and have a wonderful Sabbath.